Welcome to Conversations. I'm Muftadar Khan, your host, and this is my second in-studio conversation, which means that the guest is with me in the studio uh, in my house. I have with me Dr. Shahab Inam Khan, who is from Bangladesh. He's currently a Fulbright scholar at the University of Delaware, and he is a professor in Jahangir Nagar University, where he teaches international relations, international migration. He is also one of the most renowned scholars of international migration, but not just a scholar, but he's also worked with the UN and he's worked in many parts of South Asia, including Mauritius, Maldives, India. He has a PhD from Jawaharlal Nehru University. And uh, I will tell you more about how we are connected. Uh, but before I do that, you know what you have to do, subscribe to Conversations, ring the bell icon so that you get notifications of uh, further videos when I post them. Don't forget to like the video and share with your friends. So I'm the academic director of a program that I run with my colleague, uh, Professor Dan Bottomley at the University of Delaware. It is called Study of US Institutes. Uh, and we have the American Foreign Policy Program. So we run this program on behalf of the State Department. And way, way ago in 2010, right, Correct. <laughs> Shahab was uh, a visitor to the U.S. as part of that program. At that time, I was uh, a new professor at the University of Delaware, and I, and I was merely lecturing in the program. And we met and we actually contributed to this book uh, together. Uh, this is National Security under the Obama administration. Uh, it was edited by my colleague. Professor Mark Miller and Bahram Rajai, who is now working with the State Department and is posted somewhere in the Middle East. So we both contributed to this book. And once again, 10 years later, we are now connected. And the world is such a small place that uh, the professor with whom <laughs> Professor Shahab Inam Khan worked while he was at JNU is Sanjay Bhardwaj, who was also a, a, a Susi scholar right. a few years ago. So I know his professor too. So what we are going to do today is we are going to talk about Bangladesh, Bangladesh's foreign policy, Bangladesh's uh, challenges that it faces, what its role is in South Asia, its relations with India, with the US, with China. So welcome to Conversations, Professor Shahab Inam Khan. Thank you, sir, for inviting me. Yes, he's looking forward to the dinner we're going to have after this, <laughs> but let's uh, do the talking first and the eating later. So let us begin. And one of the success stories uh, has been the, the growth of Bangladeshi economy in the last 10, 15 years. People don't notice that, but they know that Bangladeshi economy is doing as well as Indian economy in terms of growth rates, etc. It's also doing at 6.2 is the forecast for this year. Uh, and so every time people say that India is the fastest growing larger economy, I always think of Bangladesh as one of the fastest growing smaller economies. So tell us what has been the reason why Bangladesh has done so well in the last 10 years. I think, thank you, sir, for asking me a very important question. The first issue that I would like to brought out when we are discussing this uh, is that often Bangladesh's development success or perhaps Bangladesh's stability uh, is not a forefront feature in the global media. I mean, we are still looked through the very old colonial prism that we are still to develop. Uh, as you have rightly pointed out, our economic growth has been astronomical over the past few years, uh, or perhaps over the a decade, and it has sustained. Uh, the main reasons are three. The first reason is we have a political stability so far, which means we have a very inclusive growth process in which we have incorporated all the strata of the society to come together. Uh, I think that has been one of the forefront feature of the government's success. The second important factor is that we have uh, been able to maintain a very solid relationship with two power fulcrums. Uh, one is obviously the Chinese because our majority of import comes from China. And the second is of course the Western markets, uh, whether it is the European Union uh, United Kingdom or definitely United States, 
uh, they're the largest buyers of our products. So we have to have that balance. I think the foreign policy has so far, so far done quite reasonably well in terms of balancing between the import sources and export destination. Uh, and the third important factor, I believe, is probably uh, the public uh, participation in the economic process, which has uh, increased by many folds over the past few years. Henceforth, macroeconomic, microeconomic mm -hmm. uh, mismatch has been reduced. But the problem still remains is like, how do we sustain this growth over the next few few months, uh, given the global situation in terms of currency crisis to uh, energy and so on? So, so probably uh, that's the only challenge I see. You know, I was looking at the numbers, and uh, what is interesting is that thirty percent of the GDP comes from trade, international Correct. trade, and your exports are what about forty billion dollars or more, uh, and and. Combined with imports, your trade is over hundred billion dollars or near about that. Uh, almost, almost uh, hundred billion dollars, which is tremendous because uh, I mean, compared to other countries in the region. So I was mm -hmm. looking at Pakistani international trade. That's about fifty billion dollars. You are nearly double what Pakistan is when it comes to both imports and exports. Uh, but I also noticed that while you're exporting garments to to the West primarily, you. Uh, Germany, UK, mostly Europe and North America, but everything else is just India and China in terms of trade, right? Your trade now with India is about 18 and with China close to 25 Correct. and mostly imports from China. Oh, yes, uh, I, I, as I mentioned, I mean, one of the major uh, problem, if I see yeah. from, from a very broader spectrum uh, is our export diversification is yet to mature. I mean, we are yet to uh, get a momentum in diversifying the export portfolio. Uh, and obviously, we have a huge Chinese investment in Bangladesh. That is also one of the critical reasons for Bangladesh's economy, particularly in the infrastructure backbone. Um, that's the reason we can supply cheaper goods to the rest of the world. Now, if you look at Bangladesh-India trade, uh, this is astronomical. We are the largest uh, uh, trading partner for India in the region, uh, which yeah. means we are able you, to buy. You are sixth overall. Oh, sixth overall. And uh, uh, at some point of time, we surpassed Hong Kong as well. So which means that Bangladesh's economy is now able to absorb the amount of uh, resources needed for $100 billion to pick up. Uh, I think that is uh, fundamentally important. I think another very critical issue for Bangladesh is it has no conflict baggage with anyone. So it has a very stable relationship with India. It has stable relationship with China. It has stable relationship even with, to a great extent, Pakistan. So which means that we have not been into any kind of political adventurism so far. Who, so far. But the problem remains with Myanmar. Still, I mean, if you look that look at 1.1 million refugees coming from Myanmar living in Bangladesh is certainly a source of tension. Not only Bangladesh's in Bangladesh's foreign policy, also in regional security. I mean, uh, obviously, when we looked into this Rohingya uh, crisis and repatriation process, it was the Chinese who were forthcoming. But again, repatriation didn't really pick up. Uh, it's been five years. Uh, and we also understand the geopolitical compulsion for India in engaging uh, in the uh, repatriation process too. So given all these things Bangladesh has done quite remarkable, it reached out to international community, United Nations, International Court, Gambia lodged a fire, uh, case against Myanmar, and altogether we have been doing that so far. The Americans have recognized it as a genocide against the Muslims. And uh, obviously now that the Burma Act in the United States is very much visible, which is going to probably give a lot of impetus for us to really collaborate uh, in terms of uh, resolving the Rohingya crisis and political stability in Myanmar. Had that not been the case, if the Rohingya issue was not very much prominent in our case, 
probably economy would have uh, gone much faster because we have to pay for 1.1 million people along with the international community, of course. So if you look at the largest largest uh, refugee camps in the world is in Bangladesh, and we are a small country. Uh, 170 million people in this uh, in, in, in this country, and then we have to accommodate 1.1 million people. So spending money on them uh, is also a critical factor for us. I mean, had that not been the case, probably economy would have had it. So assuming that you're spending, say, 100 dollars on Rohingyas, how much of it are you getting from international? A very, a very insignificant compared to what we spend. I mean, we do get almost like uh, uh, 200, 280 million dollars altogether. But the budget is for uh, sustaining these camps is no less than a billion dollar a year. So uh, look at the land cost, look at the host community cost, look at the uh, tent cost, look at the sanitation sanitation cost, look at the basics. So all together- Where is the money coming from? Is it coming from OIC countries or Western countries? This is coming from predominantly from the Western countries. And that is one of the, I would say, the critical foreign policy feature of the government at the moment, to have a better relationship with the Western governments. Uh, because if you look at the US spending on the Rohingya, uh, Canadian, uh, British, uh, and I, I and I think uh, that also testifies that Bangladesh's relationship with all these countries are not only economic, but it is increasingly becoming geopolitical too. So I, I was trying to understand Bangladesh's relations with uh, with India. In, hmm. India is uh, one of your major trading partners. In, Correct. You're completely surrounded by India. 100%. In fact, uh, I didn't realize till today that. India's longest border is with Bangladesh, right. which is 4,000 kilometers plus, right, right completely right. around. Uh, and so, they, I mean, at least Indians feel that we played a major role in, in, in the birth of Bangladesh right. in 1971. And the only country, I think, in the, with which India borders and does not have a border dispute, perhaps, is Bangladesh. Right? At least all the border disputes have been settled mm. in some ways. So things are looking positive. And apparently the only issues that are there is the, the illegal immigration, which Indians allege, and also the Rohingya refugees, which are also now crossing border into India, and the, the river issues, especially Tista River. So, so, but I think India's bigger fear is that India is, I guess, unable to compete with Chinese investments in Bangladesh and China's financial, um, shall we say, input into, into Bangladesh, and yet it wants to have better relations with Bangladesh. Is that how it is going? I, I, I think uh, the relationship between these two neighbors is fundamentally very strong uh, because of historical reason, for obvious reason. Uh, 1971 was, of course, an important indicator to that. Uh, but subsequently, I mean, both the countries had to deal with their geopolitical realities and the geopolitical realities are once again back because we really have to sustain uh, our economy big time. Uh, the question is not uh, for us to choose a partner, rather who becomes a natural partner in this process. Uh, we do have water uh, related problems and it is a problem uh, not from this time, and it's been a problem for five decades, which has not, not been solved. Uh, and then border killing is almost a daily feature. I mean, when I say daily, in a sense, not literally daily, but what I'm saying that that is perhaps a public uh, discourse too. What on the do you mean uh, the, the border killing, the people crossing the borders, and where. Uh, we have been advocating for humanitarian border management. I mean, you don't have to kill somebody if somebody is crossing the border. Okay. I mean, it is not an Israel-Palestine border per se. I mean, even you don't get to see that much of people being killed in India-Pakistan border too. So, so that's that's one of the very core factor uh, that includes international violation of international law. That also includes people's, you know, uh, sentiment. Uh, and then, of course, the question of uh, illegal immigration. And we deeply observe the National Registry of Citizenship in India. And probably that itself is a self-explanatory uh, 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 document where uh, the whole myth of Bangladeshi migrants going to 
India uh, has probably been questioned. I mean, we haven't done yeah. that. I mean, and 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 that's basically uh, since uh, both of us in, are into teaching, we very much understand that quantitative uh, approaches to these problems. And you look at uh, this data and uh, probably uh, these are all guesstimation and estimation. And probably with the estimation, it is very difficult to determine a bilateral relationship. That's why we are very strong relationship. And, and another problem that I think uh, which both the countries need to really think about is a collaborative approach towards uh, major uh, geopolitical hotspots, starting from Myanmar to down all the way to South China Sea to uh, even uh, if you look at the Indian Ocean and others. And that's where I think uh, both the countries have more reliance on the extra regional uh, neighbors or perhaps extra regional powers instead of each other coming together on these grounds. Theoretically, it is there, uh, but the problem lies is the capacity. <laughs> I mean, how far can we really deal with Myanmar and then uh, Bay of Bengal stability, sea line of communication and so on and so is something I think over the next few 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 years we will be gauging. With. So I was looking at India's foreign policy budget for this year, and Bangladesh is the second biggest recipient of uh, India foreign aid, correct? After Bhutan, which I, I found that it's about five hundred and fifty crore Indian rupees, correct? Um, which is not a very large amount, but. But given the fact that the Bangladesh economy is probably, I mean, for a long time there was talk that Bangladesh has a higher GDP than India. Why is Bangladesh still receiving aid from? Well, India? I think it has much more of a, a goodwill gesture between both the countries. Okay. I mean, we do. We have sent, uh, we have sent uh, uh, financial support to Sri Lanka, uh, which is probably not uh, astronomical in terms of figure, but it is again, when yeah. you have the neighbors, you always have good relationship uh, through different mechanisms. You know, I was surprised by something very, uh, that uh, when I was doing my research for this interview, I discovered that the biggest source of tourists to India is Bangladesh. Also the, the medical health. And medical health, Correct. medical health, tourism, and students. Apparently, a lot of students Correct. like you <laughs> would go to India to study. Uh, that was to me quite interesting. That is how I like. I would like to see the region. You know that India is this magnet where people come, especially for universities. It should become the USA of South Asia, at least, if not uh, of Asia and the global South. Correct. So, so to me, that was very interesting to see that uh, tourists go to India more than they go to say China <laughs> or they uh, they study here. So that is uh, reinforcing the the. I guess thousands of years of cultural Correct. and linguistic I think, I think ties. People to people contact, uh, despite whatever political regimes we have across the regions, people to people contact has always been there. I mean, uh, look at Bangladesh. I mean, we often get to argue is it India that was partitioned or it was Punjab and Bengal that was partitioned, essentially. Now, if you look at uh, the relationship with uh, Bangladesh, with it, uh, India's seven sister has always been there for 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 like centuries. I mean, uh, and even if you take the Mughal Sultanate and even Delhi Sultanate and the relationship still is there through administrative or any other procedures. But what remains as, as a major point of uh, issues between these two countries, uh, and that's and that's basically one of the uh, one of the debate that often you would get to hear in Dhaka, uh, is whether the region as a whole uh, is still uh, following its old heritage of secularism. Uh, and that's exactly where the uh, uh, where the next generation will be coming into and questioning everyone that uh, whether the state system, the political governance, uh, are still able to retain the culture that we had a uh, hundred years back or even uh, a few decades back. So the crisis of secularism is probably something starting from all the way and the gaining power, uh, Taliban power in Afghanistan and all the way down to Myanmar for Bangladesh in that matter uh, is something that is not very uh, going to be very easy for any of the countries to deal with. And how we should deal with uh, it and together is something we need to figure out in the, in the course of time. You know, we are 
we are both in the U.S. and we haven't talked about the U.S. The U.S. is playing a bigger role now. And uh, I was looking at some of your defense procurements. Right. You, you're buying submarines and helicopters from from China, and uh, and apparently the United States has also offered you with a lot of weapons. What are these weapons for? Well, uh, the first uh, problem is defense. Defensive. Defense against. Yeah, I mean, uh, defensive in a sense, like it's not offensive. Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, I mean, uh, probably this is a hard conversation that I'm getting into for a while, uh, is uh, the conversation focusing on Myanmar. I've been referring to it quite often uh, because when I mentioned that we are one of the very few countries probably in the world without any conflict baggage. So therefore, we don't want that conflict baggage to come to us. Uh, and I think one of the pre predeterminant over here is how we protect our sovereignty uh, uh, and threats to sovereignty coming from the fringe elements in Myanmar. And we get to see that the Myanmar is only becoming weaker and weaker. And the spillover effect should not be there. The second main problem is the Bay of Bengal. As you have seen that we had to go to international tribunal to settle our disputes over maritime territory with both Myanmar and India. So therefore, these particular territory, the security of the sea line of communication, strategic communication, and perhaps uh, in future, we will be exploring the resources from uh, a Bay of Bengal, our territory of Bay of Bengal. And of course, we need to provide security over there. I mean, nobody's going to invest over there, just like some pirates come and somebody, uh, illegal trawlers coming in. So we don't want the foreigners to come and give security of Bay of Bengal of our own territory. And therefore, we need submarines. We need all these equipments. And the last important factor is not only for ourselves but also to build the regional capacity. So is your budget going up, defense spending? Well, the post-COVID budget is still uh, under uh, different types of uh, spending. And therefore, I think uh, it is not a question of uh, budget going up, rather than the question of how best we can balance between the development priorities and the defense realities that we are incurring on a daily basis. Well, I don't want to get too much into this Myanmar mm. thing, but mm. if if there is a possibility of Bangladesh fighting another war after 71, then probably it's going to be with Myanmar. Yeah, of I, course. So where does India come in? I was quite surprised to learn that India has presented Myanmar with a submarine. A Russian built killer plus <laughs> Yeah. So right. I, I'm wondering what's going on here. Exactly. Like, especially <laughs> given the fact that uh, Myanmar is now a complete pariah state in the world. I mean, it's committing a genocide against its own population, generating refugees who are not just in Bangladesh, but there are also many parts. I was in Malaysia. Uh, a year Thailand, and a half, and Indonesia, they were like Malaysia. Yes. They were talking about the boat people in, in Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand. So for them, also Rohingya refugees are a matter of concern. But the international response from Asian ASEAN countries has not been very effective. Like, no. <laughs> why isn't there an effective response to this? I mean, are they waiting for the U.S. to send the Marines? Like, is there no other way in which the world can deal with their regional problems? I think I think ASEAN has always been has always taken a lukewarm policy towards its own nation states. I mean, including Myanmar. Myanmar. So. But if you look at the last two proceedings of um, ASEAN, they actually condemned, uh, literally, I mean, uh, Myanmar, although they haven't gone for any kind of actions. And at some point of time, there was a hesitation in inviting the Myanmar general to one of the meetings. Now, that, that itself also shows that ASEAN is probably reaching its own limit. And when you see... I mean, to perhaps maybe the... Its relevance also is being questioned, right? I mean, uh, and 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 uh, ASEAN's. If you look at the uh, Myanmar's geographic position, I mean, it sits uh, in between uh, Thailand and Northeast India, uh, Bangladesh and China. So therefore, I think uh, there is also a question of resource exploitation. I mean, historically, if you look at the American uh, government system or foreign policy, which heavily endorses human rights and uh, political freedom and stuff, which has not been a fore feature in, in Southeast Asia mostly. 
Uh, I'm not saying that uh, they have reverted from that, but uh, I'd say that probably that is not the prime agenda when uh, when the development comes for that. And I think that is also a, one of the critical uh, issue that Bangladesh would always reflect by saying that development should be the priority at the moment and equal distribution of resources is also a priority. Whether we have achieved that or not is a separate uh, conversation. But certainly, uh, I think uh, development remains as a core factor for Bangladesh as well as Southeast Asia, which is not a factor for Myanmar. Now they're learning from it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, notwithstanding the tremendous progress that some countries in South Asia have made in the mm. last 20, 30 years, we are still talking of countries whose per capita income is around $2,500 which is poor countries, I mean, in spite of all the tremendous 6.7% 7 growth rates for decade after decade, we are still talking of countries where their basic healthcare is not available to a large segment of the population. Education is not fully available. So, so this talk of spending resources on defense is counterproductive when I feel that most of the resources should be spent on education. And now we have the climate issue, right? Where Correct. Bangladesh is one of the biggest hotspots when it comes to climate change. Uh, and with the current G20 leadership, India is emphasizing climate issues and combating climate change is number one. Do you see, um, especially with BIMSTEC, right? BIMSTEC, mm. do you see that the climate issue becoming a dominant way in which countries which have these kinds of geopolitical conflicts can still come together and work if floods in Pakistan and, you know, uh, rising sea levels in Bangladesh, uh, or can they bring the, this region, like, can SARC come into existence and become a potent uh, institution focused primarily on climate change? I mean, I mean, I would, uh, I would start with COVID. I mean, look at how each of the countries cooperated with each other. I mean, when Prime Minister Modi of India convened a meeting, I mean, Imran Khan was present. I mean, everyone was present. And perhaps that also tells you that uh, the business as usual or the days of business as usual is over. Uh, the new technologies are coming. We don't know how to govern these new technologies. What would be the rules and regulations for this? We don't know what kind of new diseases will come, what kind of vaccines we will need. I mean, one country, uh, depending on one country, is a big mistake, has been learned by everyone in yes. God's work. I mean, starting from United States to all the way to Bhutan, everybody now understands that it has to be the maximization of resources. I mean, it's an old saying, you can't put all your eggs in one basket. In, in one basket. And uh, the difference is something like that. We can't put all our uh, our security in one basket. So therefore, we need to have our own sovereign standing and what I would often argue as strategic autonomy over the water and the territory. And the most important part over here is obviously, as you have touched upon, is the climate. And uh, our success stories are quite replicated in the Western world too. So we have provided uh, technical support to Southeast Asia too. There are a number of reasons. World's largest uh, NGO is in Bangladesh. I mean, we don't shut down the NGOs, but uh, look at the NGOs that are now rising over here. And they have a very fundamental role to play in climate change. Climate change role has been assumed by the armed forces too. So I think all together, uh, all together, uh, this is high time that all the countries should prioritize what they want to do and for which they can't really say that this country should be a part of the uh, initiative and that country should not be a part of it. Uh, probably that's too uh, primitive at the moment on technology. And that's why I said, I, I, I think we should revive, sir. If it is needed, reform, sir. And I don't understand why uh, we can't do that. I mean, Taliban in Afghanistan. I mean, India spent $3 billion over there. Uh, India was supposed to spend uh, almost $10 billion in Bangladesh's infrastructure. Uh, probably 8 to 10% only came over the last 14 years. I mean, we understand these realities. And, uh, and I think we all should have a resource distribution together and find a solution for the common problem like climate change. And I think Bangladesh-India cooperation in climate change is fundamentally very strong. Only problem is we are still to go somewhere with the water. 
Okay, so so I've been asking very easy questions so far. <laughs> <laughs> so here comes the difficult ones, the leg break. <laughs> so my next question is this. In India, there is, you know, tremendous rise of nationalism in India. Right. People talk about Hindu nationalism and Hindutva movements, etc. And one of their main agendas seems to be to create a Khan Bharat. Correct. <laughs> Enlarge India, which includes Iran to Myanmar. And so periodically some member of the RSS like Mohan Bhagwat or others would make this pronouncement that we are going to achieve a Khan Bharat in 15 years or 10. It, they seem to think of it as an inevitable uh, outcome. Uh, and, uh, it, it, you know, even if it comes through, it will have the same problem as Israel. Can Israel remain Jewish and and Secular. democratic, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so if you add another 400 uh, million Muslims uh, from Bangladesh and Pakistan to India, hmm. will India then have a significant Hindu majority or not? But nevertheless, the more, when, when we push back at this, then in a defensive posture, they make the argument that when we talk about Akhand Bharat, we are talking about cultural integration, not uh, actual uh, annexation or uh, re reunion of India as maybe it was under Aurangzeb's time or whatever. So what do you, what are the chances that countries like Nepal, Bangladesh, Bhutan, uh, Sri Lanka, uh, I don't think Pakistan would play ball, uh, so on, would be interested in a borderless economic zone in South Asia? Would the fear of India's domination prevent that or the fact that integrating with Indian economies could help these countries move up faster, maybe an attraction. So keep let the let the RSS have its cultural integration. But the more interesting attraction would be economic integration, like a borderless economy. Well, first of all, we haven't been even able to achieve connectivity, visa-free regime, anyway. <laughs> What do you mean? Uh, I mean, Bangladeshis require visa to go to India. Indians require visa to come to Bangladesh. We need Ooh. everybody needs visa. <laughs> Number one. Number two, you don't really have uh, connectivity for Bangladeshi products to go to all the way to Kabul. Kabul is a big market for us. <laughs> I mean, the Chinese are occupying the market. Pakistanis are taking the market. We want to be a part of that market. Uh, we are still. Do we've you been, fly? Uh, we have to, uh, okay. and and then we, you, you really have to talk about um, financial instruments. I mean, uh, banking between Bangladesh and India is as primitive as it has been ten years back. But banking for me with the Chinese or the Americans is much faster than any other places. I don't have to go for fill in hundreds of papers. So, no, I, so your so digital. I mean, it's Financial happening. I mean, I mean, these are happening higher. slowly, but this okay. should not be seen through only uh, the prism of Bangladesh and India. It has to be a collaborative approach. And if you take uh, Nepal and Bhutan for us, I mean, uh, we have been talking about energy import from Nepal and Bhutan. It has taken a breakthrough. Mm -hmm. It's going to happen. It's 30 miles. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, it has moved forward. And I must be optimist uh, that it is going forward, but probably you have lost uh, decades in between. So, so that gives us, and the mistakes are not in the part of any particular country. Probably the system, the political understanding mindset was always like that. Uh, and RSS and BJP's political standings are often being criticized by the Indian media itself. I mean, yeah. uh, and we get to read those things. And when we read, uh, uh, and probably uh, that doesn't uh, translate uh, the old heritage that Bangladeshis are used to. I mean, that's the point. As you have rightly mentioned, I mean, probably a one fourth uh, or uh, more than one fifth uh, foreign currency going to India is from Bangladesh. I mean, and that's understandable, medical health and trade, export, import and everything. Uh, but going towards a borderless uh, state system is probably, uh, I, 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 I think that is way too ambitious as a narrative which is good for domestic hypernationalism for sure. Uh, but I don't think uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, uh, Maldives, I mean, 
despite their size of economy uh, or despite their size of political uh, caliber, uh, is it's not going to be well received. And 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 that has three fundamental pillars. I mean, look at the culture. Had there been really cultural uh, cultural integration, uh, probably 1947 wouldn't have happened. I mean, India itself is debating. I mean, BJP itself debates. I mean, what was the role of Nehru? What was the role of Gandhi? Or what was the yeah. role of others? Or even uh, Nathuram Gautse, for say. So, uh, so I think uh, India has to come out of its and uh, come and present a solution. And I, I, I doubt whether the solutions will be coming easy for the no, Indian society. I, I think cultural cultural approach to it is going to be more of a barrier than facilitating. Absolutely. And but the economic pathway it, and, is and, probably and, the possible way of... And if you look at, sir, I mean, we've been talking about, we're the least integrated region on, on God's earth. I mean, uh, uh, I mean I'm, I'm quoting an outdated uh, data, but perhaps uh, that data is still relevant. Our uh, intra-regional trade is not even seven to nine percent. I mean, some would say five percent, some would say seven percent. Uh, I mean, uh, probably that itself tells you that we are uh, lesser integrated than the African uh, continent, which has long been plagued with I mean, different. Our conflicts. biggest trading partner is Canada, Correct. which is our neighbor. And so I think that the very fact that neighbors are not trading partners of, or biggest trading partners, I mean, where it still shows the vestiges of colonial. Where would you get that? And, and the last point is when you mentioned about that, whether the Indian uh, hegemony uh, will be an issue, probably that narrative is no longer a feature in Bangladesh politics, to be honest with you. I mean, uh, yes, you might get to hear on certain political entities talking about it and stuff like that, but probably the economic indicators, even the health basic health economy, uh, indicators, it's a, it's a paradoxical situation. We have to go to India for very good uh, treatment too. But if you took, take the mortality rates, I mean, yeah, look at the, the maternal health, if you look at the sanitation, probably we have done fairly good than many of our regional neighbors. I would strongly, I would strongly probably mention over here that uh, the more we go for uh, hyper nationalism, I mean, or perhaps propaganda, uh, probably we are going to lose ourselves more than anything else. But there's also the hard facts that you are part of the Belt and Road Initiative, Correct. which India and now the United States are getting more and more. Uh, I mean, look at the balloon affair. I mean, the, the anti-China rhetoric has now not been this high in the no. U.S. in a long time. And so <clears throat> the fact that you are so strongly connected to China economically, biggest trading partner, uh, biggest investor, biggest single uh, one item investment also, I think, is the biggest from China, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so one of the bigger ones. Yeah, yeah. So given all of that and also now increasingly defense uh, purchasing also is coming from China, isn't it? Your no, I mean, Chinese defense relationship is age old. I mean, it's not new. So, that, I mean, would that be a barrier? The fact that you're, you are more connected to, to, to China than India, will that be an issue if you talk about a borderless South Asia? Well, I, if you Take it from a very basic security studies courses. I mean, that should not be a barrier. Rather, that should be complementary. I mean, that's how uh, Europe grew. I mean, Europe uses, NATO uses Turkish uh, equipments and India uses uh, Russian equipments. And India's major defense supplier is, are the Russians. Uh, did that really made a serious problem between the United States? And it is the, becoming. It, it, it is becoming. Yeah. So it, it has. It hasn't yet. I mean, S four hundred for an example. You have a standard for Turkey got sanctioned, and for India, they're now revising the laws and stuff like that. So, so I think that these sort of narratives won't be very helpful if we politicize it. Rather, we should look into what kind of capabilities we have. And, mm -hmm. and uh, defense diversification, for an example. Bangladesh's defense diversification has often been ignored. The question is, what are we supposed to buy from our immediate neighbors? I mean, they have to offer us 
the solutions that we require. I mean, if I see that my neighbor countries are sending uh, uh, <laughs> submarines to the country, which is imminent threat for us, yeah. and 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 that too, uh, after uh, we have a defense. MOU, a cooperation MOU signed in 2017, I guess. And, and, and that's, that's where I think the political uh, understanding of each country. So we, we grew up with that. And, we, I, and we, I believe that Dhaka uh, ardently uh, respects every country's national interest and geopolitical priorities. And henceforth, we really don't put a dent in our bilateral relationship with anyone. Uh, as we understand that India's geopolitics uh, concerning Myanmar and China, we understand U.S.'s concerns in China. And obviously, it's too late. Why didn't you come out? I mean, you're now talking about that uh, we should not buy from China, but our supply to China. I mean, we can't just spend money like that. You, you know, when I was, I was looking at the, the map of India, and I kept thinking of the kangaroo which is pouch <laughs> right right, <laughs> so, right. So, so bangladesh is in the pouch of india in many ways and i think that that geographical we call uh, it we are reality, india law india law <laughs> so i i think that should be a metaphor for i think uh, relations between india and bangladesh so so we have not talked about Bangladesh much uh, uh, on this uh, show before, but several years ago, I had written an article in which I had argued. At that time, Bangladesh was more democratic than it is at the moment. So I had made the argument that Bangladesh actually busts lots of myths about how you need to have a very strong capitalist economy before you can become a liberal democracy. Bangladesh, I mean, there was a time where regardless of who wins the election, the head of uh, the government would be a woman, as there is right now, Sheikh Hasina, <laughs> who, by the way, apparently lived in Delhi for 17 yes. years. So she, she is intimately familiar with India. So we will continue this conversation about uh, the South Asia, the possibilities of South Asian integration economically, if not culturally. Uh, but uh, I want to thank uh, Professor Shahab Inam Khan for coming to the show and, and talking so candidly about uh, Bangladesh's uh, challenges, its relations with India, China, and the US. And uh, I hope you found this interesting and thought provoking. And so please subscribe to Conversations, uh, ring the bell icon, share the video with your friends and your social and political network. And don't forget to like the video. This is Muqtadar Khan. Until next time, thank you for watching. Thank you.